get started. All right, just a brief review. We started a little bit of chapter 20th um, last Friday. So who remembers just a little bit what we covered? Chapter 20th, we're moving on toward short-term business decisions. But we haven't actually made any decisions or discussed any strategies yet. We just talked about simply the concept of information and specifically what are the information that are relevant to decisions, what are the information that are considered irrelevant. Okay, so remember the keys in the first section of chapter 20, it's last Friday we went over the first section, simply talking about the nature of information. So sometimes different activities costing information and revenues, sometimes they're just not relevant to specific decisions that we're making in the future. So we do not necessarily need to look at all the cost information for various types of products, but if we're just deciding, for example, which product, whether we want to outsource a department or whether we want to process something further, we just need to look at the relevant information that relates to, specifically, that links to those decision-making process. Okay, so relevant information, we have some of the characteristics of relevant information. Those are the costs that affects future decisions, not the costs that you readily paid for last purchase transaction of a truck, remember? We talked about a truck example. If we want to purchase a new truck, we probably also want to trade in our old truck. So the information that is relevant to that decision, where to purchase the truck, where to trade in the truck, depends on what money we're getting in the future and what's the money that we're actually paying for purchasing the truck. It's not relevant to any of the information of the old truck purchasing transaction because those are the cost information that you readily made in the past and doesn't affect this current decision. Okay, other irrelevant information, for example, if it's a fixed cost that occurs no matter what. If you trade in this truck, whether you purchase it from this vendor or the other, you still have necessary fixed costs that always occur which is irrelevant to this decision making because that part of the cost doesn't change. So those are considered irrelevant costs. Okay, so last week we also talked about the cell phone example. Remember, you want to purchase iPhone 5 or you can purchase it from AT&T or from your friend if they have an excessive one that they're not using. The cost you may be purchasing these different iPhones from different vendors could be different. So this is the information that you need to collect to help you make that decision. So to sum up, the keys to making these short-term decisions that we'll be introducing in this chapter, these different six different decision makings, all of them surrounds on these two keys. First of all, you just need to use the relevant information. Sometimes fixed costs cannot, doesn't need to be considered because it occurs no matter what. There's also some portion of fixed costs that may, you could be able to avoid. So those are still relevant information. Other keys, contribution margin approach. So remember that last chapter we break down cost into variable, into fixed. This is useful for all these decision makings that I just introduced in this chapter. So you may be determining what is the contribution margin for this product, for the other product, which ones are higher, which type of product that you may want to emphasize more in the product mix decisions. Okay, so all these six decisions seems a lot, seems a lot to consider in details when you go through the chapter, but really the theme of all these decisions surrounds on these two. What is the relevant information on the cost and revenues that you will be paying or receiving later on? What is the contribution margin you're getting from these decisions? How does it change among different alternatives? And then basically what we're doing here for all these six decisions is a cost benefit analysis. What we're paying, weighing against what we're receiving. Is the cost that we're paying really worth it compared against the benefit we're getting? Is the profit high enough to cover the cost? So this is the general theme of all these decisions. Okay, so before we go into details, you have to keep this in mind. What we're trying to do here is evaluate cost and benefit. If cost is higher than benefit, obviously we won't be accepting any of the decisions later on we uh, introduce in this chapter. 
Okay, so the first two decisions in the second section here. So this was an example we went over on relevant information, irrelevant information. First two decisions here, whether or not to accept special orders and whether or not to make your pricing decisions at this particular price or a higher level or a lower level depends upon some of the information and we need to consider some of the factors here. So first decision here, whether to accept a special order or not. What are some of the things that you may be able to guess that you will need to consider if you're a manager? You produce regular products and now you have a customer that requests a large quantities of these products at once. Perhaps it beats all the 100 customers' quanti orders, quantities, um, and quantities. So basically, if 100 customers perhaps will be able to purchase 1,000 products from you, this particular customer is already requesting 1,000 products in one order. Whether or not you're able to accept this order, what do you think it's based upon? I mean, how would you make your decision? How much material you have on hand do you actually have enough to produce the products? How much time you have? So all of these factors in capacity, right? Could be the capacity of the machines, capacity of their labor, capacity of basically the total facilities that you have, machines, the tools. Are you actually able to make all these products? You know, are, are you able to actually make them on time as requested from customers? So this is the first, the initial consideration here. Do you have excessive capacity? This is the first and the most important one. This is the assumption of whether to accept it later on. You have to fulfill this requirement before doing any further analysis. So for example, if you own, let's say a small copier printer company, you have three machines in your business. And if these machines work 12 hours, since assuming that your operation hours is 12 hours every single day, and they continue to copy nonstop, let's say every hour they're able to do 1,000 pages of copy jobs. So 12 hours, they're able to do 12,000 for this machine, 12,000 for the other, and another 12,000 pages for the third machine. Altogether, every single day, your maximum capacity is 36,000 pages. Right? So this is the physical capacity of this business. For every single day, they may be just able to copy nonstop 36,000 pages. So if a customer comes in to request a printing job, let's say right now you already have customers requesting 20,000, and another customer comes in to request another 20,000 pages in a day. Let's say they want to copy all of the materials they need for the entire semester. The physical capacity tells you that the company is actually not able to accept this order, right? They currently already have these much orders. They now want to add in one more, but altogether you need to produce 40,000 copy pages from, for the customers. The physical capacity here already is lower than the request from customers. You may not be able to accept this order unless you are willing to purchase another machine to do this job. But if this is not a regular order that comes in every single season or on a regular basis, this is not worth it, right? So the first consideration here is whether you have enough machine, enough material, enough people to actually fulfill the requirements that the customer is asking. Now let's say you do have, you do have enough capacity. You have actually four machines. So what will be the next question? You do have idle machines there. You can fulfill the request. Now, what if the customer now demands a lower price than other customers? Since right now they're giving you a large quantity of job here. And if before each page you cost, let's say, 50 cents, now they're demanding each page with just 10 cents. So what will be the second question? If, if there's even a profit there, exactly. 
The second question, if you do have capacity, the second question would be, is the incremental sales, even though you're providing them at a discounted price, is the incremental sales actually more than the incremental cost? So meaning that if the variable cost for generating one page plus the fixed cost, let's say, is already 10 cents, and they're demanding a revenue at 10 cents, meaning they're only asking you to charge them at 10 cents. This doesn't, this just actually covers the cost, but you're not generating any profit here, okay? So this discount amount, of course, you, you may be able to provide them a discount perhaps at anywhere between 0.4 and 0.2, for somewhere more than perhaps 15 cents a page. Any number above this variable cost plus fixed cost will be able to give you a profit. So you have to set the price or negotiate a price with them at a discounted point, but you're still getting profit, okay? So to sum up, this decision making, if you draw a decision tree here, first question you're asking is whether you have enough capacity. So you need to evaluate the tools, the machines, equipment you have in the business. If you do fulfill this question, you do have enough capacity. Second question is, are they demanding a discount price? And is that price enabling your company to actually cover fixed cost and also cover variable costs. If this also gives you a profit, then you can accept the order. Otherwise, you will need to decline it because you definitely don't want to accept a job using up all the facilities, the time, but then not generating enough profit. Perhaps if you don't, re if you don't accept that order, you just accept a regular customer's order, you may be able to get more profit from that. Okay, so again, the first question here, is there enough capacity, idle facilities to help you fulfill this requirement? Even though it's a large quantities job, it's very appealing, but if there's no profit, then you still need to reject the special order. Okay, so if your company already reaches the break-even point, then to accept a special order, the decision is actually even easier because you just need to cover the variable costs that the special order requests. Remember, if the company breaks even, that means they readily cover the fixed cost. So as long as your fixed cost is within the specific relevant range, you're not bumping into a second range or a third range. As long as you're within the fixed cost relevant range, it doesn't change, and you may be able to accept this customer order as long as you cover the variable cost. Okay, so this is also using the concept we learned in the last chapter. Remember, variable cost, fixed cost, this portion happens no matter what. So if you already have a break-even sales that covers fixed cost, covers variable cost at that point, any orders above that, you just need to cover the variable cost part because this is already covered from all the break-even sales that you made. The variable range? Well, can you say that again? So the design factor would be if the order covers the incremental cost of each. Well, if, it, if your company already broke even, then the fixed cost is already covered. And if the new order that comes in does not bump your fixed cost into a higher range, then you just need to cover the variable costs in case close. You can accept the order, okay? But if your company hasn't break even yet, you also need to consider fixed costs because you need to make sure that this order also covers fixed costs, not at a sales price too low that doesn't cover either one of them, okay? So the general idea here is these two questions. Other side considerations would be if the you have idle capacity, but the order is large to a quantity that actually bumps your fixed costs into a second range, then you need to reconsider this as well. Okay, but most of the problems you see in the chapter, unless it specifically tells you the fixed cost has a different rate after accepting the special order, you can assume that fixed cost is the same. So basically, variable cost is the one that plays the most important role. You need to obviously cover that get contribution margin for each unit you're producing before discussing anything else. Okay, so these two questions, 
Other considerations, perhaps you may want to consider also would other customers know about this, right? So this depends on customers' relations, how well you're able to negotiate with these customers to ask them to either keep it to themselves or you can set specific strategies that this discount is only for certain quantities and up or for certain seasons, right? So to avoid some of these problems, you may also set some strategies or some of the companies may decide just to not risk this and just set the price as the 50 cents and above. They don't want to provide discounted price. Of course, the risk is you may not be able to get this order from customer anymore. Perhaps you can reduce these risks. Okay, so these are just some of the considerations that management level will need to keep in mind before they make these decisions. Okay, this is the first one, special order. Related to numbers, the ones are definitely, you need to compare incremental cost against incremental sales. If sales exceeds it, covers variable costs, covers fixed costs, that's the most important thing, you're getting profit, then this will lead you to actually accept the special order. Okay, now let's take a look at this example here. Going back to chapter 16 and 17, we had Excel DVDs examples. Remember there's regular DVDs and special DVDs. So let's say that there's a customer that comes in to purchase a large batch of DVDs, 10,000 discs at once, and now they want to request a lower price. Originally it was $12 each, now they want it at $6.75. This is a huge discount there if we actually do accept this. So now the next question is, let's assume that the company already broke even, so fixed cost is not something that you need to worry about because that's already covered by current sales. If they want to accept this, then the only question left is whether this covers variable costs, right? So assuming the variable cost is $6.50, then they actually do cover variable costs for every DVD that they're, they're selling. So overall, they're still getting an excess operating income, $2,500 comparing the differences between the revenue they're getting and the cost they're spending, right? So the question here is, do they actually are able to cover, are they actually able to cover the variable cost after the break even? And so for this specific case here, we do actually accept this order because it covers the variable cost, you're able to generate profit, $2,500 at once. So perhaps other customers, if they just purchase 10 or 20 of them, you're only able to accumulate this profit after many sales entries. But now you're able to get this 2,500 at once. Okay, is this confusing or okay? So capacity is the first question. Second is whether the incremental sales covers incremental variable costs. And if fixed cost remains the same and it does cover the variable cost, then we can accept a special order. Okay, so the main decision rule here again, revenue compared against cost. Remember, general theme for each and every question, we're doing cost-benefit analysis. If the output is profit, then we can accept the order. Otherwise, we reject the special order. Even though the quantity is very appealing, but if at the end we're not getting profit, there's no point to fulfill this requirement. Okay, let's take a look at an example. Try to apply this to cases here. So this company now produces baseball cards in packs, and they have a customer that is requesting at once 57,000 baseball card packs. And this, camp, this special order, they want to um, receive a pack at 41 cents, each of them. A total, they may be getting revenue $23,370. However, producing these costs is 61 cents. Okay, so first of all, try to do a breakdown analysis, incremental analysis, which means try to calculate what's the revenue they're getting minus what's the cost they're spending here. Incremental analysis is just comparing revenue against the cost. So the first question here, assuming fixed cost is the same. So will they be able to accept this, whether or not they have an incremental operating income? So try to calculate that first. Second, assuming that 
Generating that order actually does affect fixed costs. You need to purchase additional machines for it and does spend additional $5,900. So will this affect their decision? So two cases here. One without the change of fixed costs, one with additional fixed costs. Remember that fixed cost is the same? So basically you need to compare variable costs. Okay. So the answer you want to get here at the end is how much operating income you're generating and whether you're accepting the order or not, okay, for both questions. Now for the first one here, if fixed cost is the same, then that means producing each pack, what really matters is the variable cost. Okay, meaning that fixed cost, if you, per, if you produce more products, is just spread along each and every unit at a lower cost, but all together the total fixed cost is the same. Okay, so what we really need to compare is whether the 41 cents per pack that revenue you're generating covers the variable cost per pack. So from the table over here, what is the variable cost per pack? It's variable overhead is 12 cents, but there's also direct materials, meaning that the more you produce, you have the more materials. So all together you have 0.13 plus 12 cents, and also the direct labor, add them all together would be 31 cents. This is the variable cost. Okay, so if fixed cost is the same, we don't have to worry about that. Just need to compare whether variable cost is higher or lower than 41 cents. So this actually is lower than, the cost is lower than the revenue you are getting. 
So for each and every one of them, you're generating 10 cents of profit, right? Because your variable cost is three, 31 cents, your revenue you're receiving for each and every pack is 41. The difference is here is 10 cents, which is the operating income, or you can say the contribution margin you're generating from this particular sales order. If you actually accept it, the increase in revenue would be given to you in the, from the problem, multiplying 57,000 packs by the 41 cents will give you 23,370. Then the cost, the incremental cost that you're spending to produce this special order, again, the number of packs multiply the variable costs. Remember, variable cost goes up as sales orders increases. So that is the floating cost that will go up along with sales. So after subtracting this from sales, you can determine that, okay, for this special order, if we do accept it, we're generating profit $5,700. Okay, if we already, this number one here, we assume that fixed is the same. So what does that mean? That means that even though per pack fixed cost right now is assigned as 30 cents, assuming that right now you have 30 cents, multiply the current production you already made, assuming, then you have 30,000 fixed costs, but now if you have additional pack, you're just dividing it by more units. So fixed is already fixed there. You already spent that cost. So regardless of the orders that you have, as long as it's within a specific range, it's that cost over there for all of them. Okay? Exactly. So how did you factor that in? adding to this. Okay, so it has to be somewhere in the middle here, right? You consider variable cost and then if you have additional fixed costs occurred specifically for that order. So if we go back to the copy your example, perhaps you need to purchase additional machines. For this order, if you need to incur additional machines or techniques, fixed cost specifically for this order, and overall, you're actually losing $200 after accepting this. So the decision here will be rejecting this special order. Now, even though it covers variable costs, but if you are, right now the capacity doesn't allow you to produce this many packs and you actually need additional costs spent for this, overall you may not decide to accept this because you still have fixed costs incurred additionally. If in the future you expect that the sales is going to increase, this particular special order will lead to a demand in the future, then that will be another case, yes. So this is a simple case assuming that currently the demand is stable for this particular product. And now if you have a special order, larger quantities or a different design, will allow you to spend more money here but doesn't really affect in the future sales, then you will have to reject it. But if this is something that is demanded from the market, later on you expect it to grow, then this will be considered an investment that you're doing. You probably will change your decisions, yes. But that's in a more complicated setting. Okay? Okay, any other questions? Now a lot of the examples given in this chapter here, we're just assuming that the more we produce, we're actually able to sell the quantity that we're producing. Because remember, this is an intro class, so we're still keeping all the settings at a very basic level. But of course, factoring in other advertisement costs, marketing costs, the demand from customers, a lot of these decisions may be changed by other considerations. Okay. But the general rule here, of course, the first question you need to ask in the company whether to accept this order or not, whether you're actually able to complete all the products on time. Second would be cost revenue analysis. If cost exceeds it, then you don't have to accept this. If the revenue exceeds it, then of course you have the reason to accept the order.
Okay, second, let's take a look at another decision here. How do we actually set the price for products? So to determine the price for a product, other than determining a target profit in your business for this season, other than understanding customers' requests for the product, some of these strategies here actually differs and varies, depends on the nature of the industry that your company is in. So for example, how the price setting for certain groceries, for the pounds of apples that you purchase, for the pounds of oranges, will differ a lot for how price is set for technology related products. Okay, so whether a company is a price taker or a price setter, the strategies for setting the price is different. Okay, so what do I mean by this? Price takers typically are the business in the industry that produces products without very much different among their competitors. So it could be groceries, food business. Typically, for example, for me, if I go to the grocery store just to get some fruits, I usually don't do a bunch of analysis on which areas, the quality of the fruits, because I usually assume that the quality would not vary that much between ShopRite, Pathmark, Stop and Shop, right? Probably I would just go to the grocery store that is closest to where I live. But as opposed to this, if I want to get a new smartphone, what would you do? You would do some research on the advantages of these products. What is the, some of the features that you can see from this product, but you don't get from the others? You have a uniqueness in your product, which gives you more control on setting the price of your product. Okay, because the product you're offering to customer at least you're making the customer to believe that there's a uniqueness in your product that you can't get from others, from competitors, as easy as if you get it from your company. Right? But for some of the food commodities, natural resources, really the products they're offering to customer doesn't vary that much among the competitors. So for these business, when they set the price, typically they go backwards. They need to know, first of all, What's the customer's request for the product? What's the desired profit? And then they set their target price. So remember we actually talked about this in chapter 17. Target costing, target pricing approach, this typically works for price taker companies. For the companies that doesn't provide products as special as compared to their competitors, if really the uniqueness is not that obvious, then they need to know what is the market price. Because if they go beyond this market price too much, the customers may not be willing to purchase the product from them. They may not be able to get their target sales at all. So the price setting can defer that much from the market price. Then they figure out what's their profit. They strive to meet this target cost in order to get this target profit. So this is the strategy usually used for price takers. As opposed to this, for price setters, since their products is a lot more unique than their competitors, they have some of the features that other companies may not be able to provide, they may be able to first determine what is really the cost that they're producing their products, and then add up their target profit, then set the price. And it could somewhat differ from customer's demand, because if customers believe that this product is better than others, they may be willing to pay a higher price, even though it's not originally their requested price. Okay, so the first, first strategy here for price takers, again, we usually follow the target cost approach. So what we mean by target cost approach is, first of all, understanding what is the market price the customer is demanding. Work backwards to try to meet the target cost in order to get that target profit. Okay, or the other way around, you get the market price first, and then you minus your target full cost to figure out what is the desired profit that their company is able to get in this season or future seasons. So this approach works better for price um, taker companies because, again, their products doesn't differ that much among competitors.
So for these companies, the more they're able to reduce their product cost, the more desired profit they're getting. Because really, they don't get that much control in setting the price too high above the market price. This will make their company, put their company in a dis disadvantaged position in the industry. Because really, their products are not as unique. So what they could do to get more profit is to try to meet this target cost or possibly lower down the cost providing the same quality of products. Okay, now as some of the other considerations they may be able to get, of course, lower down the cost, you look at it in different aspects. You have fixed costs, you have variable costs, may be able to cut down some of the machine's cost, or of course some of the other variable cost on materials, um, on the workers that you hire, the pay rates. All of these strategies will help the price taker, uh, price setters companies to try to maximize their profit. So not going toward the road of setting a higher price, but try to lower down the cost in different areas. But of course, this has to be made in a combined consideration with the quality of the products. And you can't just completely lower down the direct materials cost and then not consider the output of the product, whether it meets the quality standards. Right? Or you could try to add some uniqueness to your products. And this, of course, will require more on the advertising, marketing side. Try to make your products stand out from competitors to lean more toward the price setting companies. Okay, so these are some of the options that for price um, takers industries, if their products by nature is just not as competitive in the industry, these are some of the strategies that they can use to try to boost up their profit. Okay, what about price setters? So price setters, as opposed to this strategy, since their products are more unique, has some of the functions that customers may believe other vendors, other providers will not actually provide them. They determine, first of all, what is the manufacturing cost. Again, for technology-related companies, if they're creating smartphones and a different, um, adding different features. For example, not just going onto internet, but add in some of the fancy features that other competitors doesn't have. Then what is the cost they need to manufacture the product is the first consideration they need to make. And then what is the desired profit? What's their goal? But of course, they, at the end, they can't set a price ridiculously high. They still need to refer to customer's demand. But it's just that the customer's demand is not a strict strategy that they actually have to go toward, or the um, customer's demand is not actually the fixed price that they have to set their pro product's price on. So they actually have more control over setting the price if they're able to make believe that customers make customers believe that they have specific features that other competitors doesn't have. Depends on your industry. Okay, so if you're able to combine with marketing strategies, advertising strategies to really focus on some of the uh, strengths of your product that other people will believe that this really is different from the competitors then you're leaning more toward the price setting side but again in nature food business really is harder for them to do that because it's necessity in the, everybody's lives right? Okay, let's take a look at this example here. If we want to produce, let's say, 100,000 DVDs, and um, assuming that these are the special DVDs that you're able to produce, when we set the price here, you need to understand, of course, what is the manufacturing cost, which we learn in Chapter 16, 17. How do we break down these costs and then combine them at the end, mark up a price to determine the retail price for each and every product? So you have fixed costs, 160,000, plus, um, of course, the variable costs all together. The cost for generating these special DVDs costs $810,000. And your desired profit here for this season is 300,000. So you add that part up, the target revenue will be this dollar amount, and then you spread it out, the units that you actually produce. 
So this is just the steps of how you add up the costs, market the desired profit, and how you set the price for each and every unit. Of course, all these decisions, the desired profit, needs to be re referenced on also customers' demand for this product. Okay, but just again for um, companies that provide more unique products, they just have more control over setting the price. If it differs from the market price, it wouldn't really affect their profit that much compared against some of the price takers businesses. Okay, so the decision rule here, general rule is what types of business this, um, what types of company this specific business is in. Is it a price taker company? Is it a price setter? Some of the companies may be somewhere in the middle. You may have some of the products that really is not that unique as others. You may have some of the products that really is their core um, advantage, competence in the business. Each of these, how you price the product will be different. So you may follow a target pricing approach for price takers and cost plus approach for price setters. All right, let's apply this to a problem here. A lot of this theory, a lot of the process the steps, so how do we apply this to this particular example? So assuming that this company um, does plants for garden centers, and currently they have that assets that are worth $4,800,000. Now the fixed cost for producing these plants and maintaining these plants cost them $600,000. Variable cost for each of the gallon size plant cost $1.35. And currently their uh, producing volume is 470,000 units. And the competitor offers $3.60 for each of them. So this implies that this is the market price that the company, that the customers will be requesting, $3.30. So that's the market price, and you know all the cost information. What will be the target cost for this company? That's the first question. So it tells you that how we determine the target profit is 10% of asset. So you use 10% times the 4,800,000. That's the return on assets. Determine that first and then try to calculate what's the target cost that a company is aiming at getting in order to get the target profit. Uh, you do have to consider that. If you already get the tar got the target full cost, then second question is, based on currently the cost information, is the company actually able to get the target profit? Or actually they're not able to meet this profit, they're getting less.
365. How did you get the 365? The first one? You want to try? Okay. Okay. Okay, so what is that cost here? Is that the actual cost or is it the target cost? Actual cost, okay, so you got the part of the answer for number two, right? Whether it's meeting the target cost, but how are you getting the target cost? Okay. So that will give you the unit cost, right? Okay. Now you got part of it correct, especially the second part. What is the actual cost of the product? But for the first question here for target cost, since $3.60 is already the market demanding price, so first of all, you'd multiply that by the number of units. And then what you need to consider is the desired profit, which again is what you talked about. It's the 4.8 million multiplied 10%. This is the profit, specifically this problem tells you how to calculate it, is 10% of assets. It could be other ways. It could be 10% of the sales price, 10% of assets. Depends on the problem. It will specifically tell you how to calculate a desired profit or directly give you the number. So the desired profit here is $480,000, but the current market price is $1,692,000. So you subtract that desired profit from the market price, your cost this is the target, your goal should be somewhere here in order to actually get this desired profit. Okay, so to get the target cost, you just need to compare what's the market price against your desired profit. Yes, it's just a switch around. So it depends on which information you have first. Some problems will ask you what is the target profit. Some problem will ask you what is the target cost. You will have either one of the information to determine the other one. Okay. So once you get this, then it comes to what you calculated for the second question. What is the current cost that they're spending on producing these products? So the current cost, you have variable costs, you have fixed costs. If you add them together, this gives you 100, uh, 12, I don't know, you even know how to uh, pronounce this. Like one, two, three, four thousand five hundred. And all of these compared against the target cost, which we got in the first question, what does it tell you? This one, two, three, four thousand five hundred compared against the previous number. So you're able to are they able to meet the profit or not? No, because they're spending more, right? And how much more? You can just subtract this number from this. This is the current cost that you're actually producing, using to produce these products. This is the goal that you're trying to meet. So right now, the current cost is too high. So companies can either try to cut down the fixed portion, try to cut down variable cost. If they don't want to go beyond the current market price, they need to some way try to cut down the cost in different areas. Okay. Now the third question, what was it? So third question, we want to have a reduced variable cost and try to see if we're able to get, actually meet the desired profit after cutting down some of the variable costs. All right, so since from the first two, you already know the current cost is too high, it's above the target um, full cost. Then for the third problem here, if we're able to reduce just the variable cost, assuming fixed cost is the same, so if we compare the reduced variable cost against the target, which is the goal of our cost in order to get profit, you realize that the new target full co fixed cost should be $648,000. So you can also not calculate the target fixed cost. You can also figure the, whether this lower down variable cost actually meets desired profit if you just calculate overall what's the operating income you're getting. Okay, so this is one way where you can calculate the operating income and just compare against the target income. Either way, if your fixed cost here, new target fixed cost, is actually higher than the current fixed cost you're getting, 
that you know that if you reduce this variable cost, you're actually able to meet the target profit goal. Okay, so meaning that if we reduce the variable cost, that will be the new variable cost we're getting. Remember from the first question, we calculated our target cost. So then the target fixed cost should be 648000 It has to be somewhere below this in order to meet your profit goal. And then if you compare that against the current fixed cost you have, your current fixed cost is lower than the goal. So we're actually able to meet the profit goal if we actually reduce variable costs to this amount. So again, you can compare the fixed cost or you can just simply compare after reducing the cost what's the operating income you're getting. Compare that with the target income. Either way, this will tell you the same conclusion. So if you're actually getting the more target, more income than the target income, then you're actually able to get the desired profit. You will decide to choose, if possible, to lower down the variable cost to this level. Income for this one, you'll just be using, since the market price is the same, right? Because we already know it's competitive, so we need to accept this current revenue market price. And then the new variable cost you got from the third question here is using the 1.2, multiply all the units you have. So the same would be 564. Then you need to minus the current fixed cost that you have. So this is telling you that the fixed cost has to be somewhere below 648 in order to get to the desired profit. But if you subtract these two, the answer would be the operating, the income that you're actually getting after this. Okay, so to sum up this decision here, basically for price takers, price setters, depends on how unique your product is. Usually how you set the price, the strategies are different. This particular problem, if it tells you, for any problem, if it tells you the current market price and they have to accept it, that means they're more toward the price taker side. So it's more competitive in their industry. They can't really go too far away from the current market price, otherwise people may not be even purchasing their products. So they move backwards, they figure out the target price first, minus the desired profit to set the cost. So this question here, they're trying to rearrange the cost in order to meet the profit by reducing a portion of variable cost. So as opposed to that, if you're a price setter, you have actually innovative products, technology related, it's easier for you to actually have control over sales price because your product is special. It introduces some of the functions that other, your competitors does not have. Okay, let's move along to third and fourth decision makings, whether we decide to drop a product or not, and how do we mix the products in sales. So what are some of the things that will come to mind if you want to decide whether to drop a product in, from your business or not? What is the main question there? Do you have a profit or not? And then since we learned about variable costs and fixed costs, so both of these needs to be considered. Remember sometimes, just like how we decide on special orders, if the fixed cost is the same, then really what matters is variable costs. Is your product actually getting any contribution margin or not? If you're not getting contribution margin, then it has to be a definite no. Drop it, meaning to drop the product. Because if you're not getting any contribution margin, then let it alone covering fixed cost. Okay, so let's say the company has these two products here. What are the information you can actually catch from this? Well, the upper part tells you all the sales, variable cost, fixed cost. What about the last line? Operating income. So for this product, we have a plus operating income. For this, we have a negative one. Now sometimes negative doesn't necessarily mean you have to drop the product. Okay, so in more detailed sense, we need to compare whether this negative mostly comes from fixed cost or contribution margin. Uh, or the variable cost part. So the first question will be, 
whether or not this particular product is actually getting contribution margin or not. If this number here is also negative, then you can just decide to drop the product because your sales price, basically, if this is also a less unique product, you have to accept the market price, and you're spending too much cost time producing the product, not each and every area, you can't easily find areas to cut down the cost. If this part is already negative, then you can just decide to drop the product as a whole. But for this particular example, you have a plus on contribution margin, but after considering fixed cost, you have a negative operating income that we need to consider further. Some of the things we need to break down the analysis, whether, where exactly did this minus 420 come from? So, so these are some of the relevant information and considerations here. Yes, because this part here, fixed cost, we may be assigning fixed costs to different products, but that's because we're basing all these assignments, remember, on ABCs. So we assign the cost to different jobs, right? But some of the costs, if you take away that product line, you may be just assigning more to other products. Those are the costs that readily occurred. Okay, so if you drop this product line and this is the cost that you readily paid is still there, next season is also there, even though you don't produce this product anymore, then this is something that basically doesn't matter. Whether you have this product or not, or you drop it, this is the cost that already incurred and will still be there next season. So what really matters is the variable cost part. Are you able to reduce it? And you're st if you're still getting positive contribution margin, then you probably want to narrow that further variable cost part to get more contribution margin and let this part be plus. Yes, get more profit out of it. Which part is the same? Uh, your question is if this fixed cost will change, if it's not stable? Well, the price setting, again, goes back to the previous question, then, previous decision making. So if the price setting, I mean, if the product is already competitive and, again, it's not as unique, you probably don't have that much control over setting the price. You can definitely move it up, but you may not be getting as much sales as now, right? So really the way to go toward is how to cut down the cost. But here we're trying to say that if the cost, you already rearranged it somehow, it already reaches a point that it's just not getting profit, and if it's not even covering the variable costs, then that means that either the demand is not as high, or just um, basically you're not selling it at the strategy that makes this profit, make this product stand out. So to drop a product or not, you need to consider these following questions here. First of all, the most important one, the assumption is that in order to sell the product, you have to have a positive contribution margin first. Without this, just like special order considerations. Without capacity, there's nothing more to discuss on. So without a positive contribution margin, you can't even cover variable costs, let alone covering fixed costs, then you just, you don't have to discuss this anymore. It's definitely dropping the product. So some cases, if you're able to set the price at, let's say, $20 earlier, but nowadays, the economy is not as well, or the demand for this product is just not as much. The product went obsolete then perhaps the sales revenue you're generating is not covering any production costs that you're producing the product. Okay, so the first question, if it's a no, then definitely you should drop this product line. It doesn't worth it to spend the cost on producing it anymore. Second, we take a look at fixed costs, whether these fixed costs are still there after you drop the product or not. 
if the fixed cost is still there, it relates to some of the machines that you purchase also for other products, then these are irrelevant information for this particular decision. Because regardless of having a product, not having a product, you still have to spend the cost on these machines for other products. And this is not something we need to consider in this particular decision making. But if some portion of the fixed cost is particularly just related to this product, some of the machines or tools that you purchase specifically for this product, once you drop it, those costs also disappears. And this is something you also need to consider. So what is the cost saving you're able to make after dropping this compared against what's the revenue that you're not making from dropping this product? So if the cost saving is a lot higher than the revenue you're not making, then definitely the answer is drop the product. If the cost saving is still lower than the revenue that you're giving up, then you still have to keep the product. Okay, so first question is whether there's a positive contribution margin or not. If it's negative, then drop the product. Second, in terms of fixed costs, so there's certain fixed costs that can also be avoided after you drop the product. When you drop it, these are the techniques that you no longer use anymore. You can drop the cost of depreciating these fixed assets. So these are some of the costs you need to consider. Consider the cost that you can save. Now, after dropping the product, perhaps if the fixed cost is the same, you have some free capacity, free machine hours to produce other products. These are also some of the costs that you need to consider. Perhaps you have additional profit that you can generate from using that idle machine hours. So all of these factor together, you consider all these three main questions together to see at the end what is the cost that you're saving, what's the revenue that you're not getting, weigh them and see which one is higher. Cost saving is more, then you should drop the product. Cost saving is still less, then you keep the product. Okay, so it's not just about the operating income at the end, because some of the fixed costs you may be able to avoid, some of the fixed costs will be there regardless of you have this product or not. So really you need to consider is the contribution margin, whether you're getting it or not, and what portion of fixed costs that will still remain, which portion you can avoid. Compare all of them together. Okay, so main decisions here. After knowing that you have contribution margin, then evaluate cost saving and the revenue that you're giving up. So some of the decisions here, if you want to make the dropping decision, so which one of them do you need to consider? Are you sure? Dropping electronic products line will affect sales if it's, what affects sales of its other products such as CDs? So this is also something that if you drop this product line, why would we need to consider this? So if you go to a department store, let's say a woman's department store, you have clothes, shoes, jewelry. If you decide to drop the jewelry section, will, some, will you lose some of the customers if they come all together to purchase all of these products? So this is also some of the analysis side that you may want to consider. How would dropping this product line also affect other products? How will that affect other products' contribution margin? Okay, so A is necessary. B, the costs it would save by dropping the product line. Definitely. The variable cost, the fixed cost. C, the revenue it would lose from dropping the product line. The revenues it will lose from dropping the product line is a yes. So it is all, yes. Just wanted to think a little bit further. Okay, so it's actually all of them. Why do we need to care about the revenue? Because you remember we're weighing what is the cost that we're saving and what's the revenue that we're not getting after dropping it. Right? If you have this product here and now it's getting you zero, negative operating income, you want to weigh if you drop the product, what's the cost that you're, lose, you're actually saving. You're saving some portion of variable cost. You may be saving a portion of fixed costs, may not. Depends on different products. So the answer is actually all of them, yes. Don't be confused by me to be able to decide this. Okay, so I know so far all of these decision makings, it's a little, it seems like a lot of considerations, but really the overall theme is just weighing what you're getting 
against what you're spending. Right? Or for this particular drop decisions, what you are not getting, the revenues that you're losing that you're giving up against the cost that you're saving. Which one is more? If you're saving more costs, then definitely do not keep this product, just simply drop it. If you are still getting more revenues, okay, it's a matter of fact that some of the variable cost is too high, maybe you can still try to reduce the variable cost and try to make this um, operating income between this revenues and the cost a little bit wider. Okay, now product mix. So product mix, remember last week we talked about weighted contribution margin. Anybody still remembers a little bit of weighted contribution margin? What's the first step? When we want to calculate a weighted ratio, of course you need to know how many products you have and what's the specific contribution margin you're getting for each product. What do you time that by? Remember sales mix. It could be one to one, it could be three to two. For every three products that you're selling, how many of the other products you're selling? So that sales mix information affects the total contribution margin you're getting for your business. How do we decide which types of products that we want to emphasize more than others? This depends on the physical capacity that your business has, how many machines. Remember the copier example, if we just tap three machines, each and every one of them, you're just able to use it for 12 hours. How are you able to use them wise enough to generate the most profit? Okay, so the physical capacity of the business is a restriction that because each and every business you don't have all of the unlimited resources. You definitely have just a number of workers, a number of techniques and tools that you can use. How do you use them wise enough to generate the most profit? This has to be considered what's the constraints in the business and how would you able to mix them with the total products types you have. Okay, so some of the constraints comes from machine usable hours, labor working hours. We want to produce products that really gives you the most contribution margin per hour of production cycle. Okay, so meaning that you may have Excel DVDs, special DVDs. If you look, look at one unit, perhaps each unit of Excel DVDs, regular ones, you just sell them at $10. Special DVDs, you're able to sell them at $50. But each and every hour, you're just able to produce specialty DVDs, 10 of them. But you can actually produce Excel DVDs at a higher volume, let's say 200 of them. So even though the unit price is lower for regular DVDs and for specialty ones is higher, Perhaps the contribution margin you're getting from this is only a dollar for each and every disc that you sell. But overall, every hour producing these regular DVDs, you're able to get $200 out of it if you're able to sell all of them. But for this, let's say the contribution margin is $5. After an hour of production, you can just get $50 out of it because physically you're not able to produce as many of them. Okay, so even though each unit may be giving you more contribution margin, but if based on the constraint, the machines that you have, every single hour you can't produce as many of them, the production cycle cannot catch up with sales, then it's not worth it sometimes to produce the ones that has higher contribution margin per unit. Even though it seems like this is the way to go, but if you can actually generate as many units, you can match up with the sales speed then you're probably just better to go toward the regular DVDs, sell at a lower contribution margin per unit, but more in quantity. Okay, so the decision making here is that if you just have 12 hours to use your machine, you have to use them wise enough to generate enough profit. Okay, but of course, if there is a very large demand on this product, you may want to go toward this road. So we're assuming here that if the demand is about equal, if you can produce as many of the Excel DVDs, you're able to sell as many of them, and it's better to go toward the one that overall every hour will give you the most contribution margin. So we're not just considering the unit cost contribution margin, but also factoring in for every machine hours you use, for every labor hours you use, how much you're getting out from it. 
Okay, let's take a look at this last exercise problem. That'll be at the end of today. So if you just glance through these three departments, the sales information, expenses, operating income, and assuming that all the fixed costs here are avoidable fixed costs, meaning if you drop the department, that cost disappears. It's not a cost that always, always stays there. It specifically relates to that department. So try to determine which departments will this company potentially need to drop, which ones they may consider to keep. Accessories has the red flag there, operating income 18,000. But if we look closer to costs, what else information can we get from it? First of all, contribution margin, right? Does it give a positive contribution margin? $8,000, right? However, this $8,000 is not able to cover fixed costs, $96,000. And what is the characteristics of these fixed costs? Does it remain there in the business or does it disappear after dropping it? It disappears. So meaning that the total cost you're able to save after dropping that department would be how much? 26000 of fixed costs and then also variable costs and you drop the department, right? So altogether, because this particular question tells you that a fixed cost is avoidable, meaning if you drop that department, that cost disappears, you add that with the total variable cost, so the total cost saving is exactly the department's total cost, $118,000, right? Then you compare against the revenue that you're losing after dropping that department is the exact sales revenue that you're generating, 100000 so the cost you're saving is 118, and the revenue you're not getting, that you're giving up, is 100,000. So the cost saving exceeds the revenue, $18,000. You should decide to drop the department because anyhow, you're not getting. The revenue is not covering the cost. The cost is way too much. So if this question of the fixed expenses is actually unavoidable, it's always there, then the question, the answer may not directly be dropping the product. You have to consider further. Because if the cost is actually unavoidable, then what you really need to determine is whether there's contribution margin or not. And for this problem, there actually is contribution margin $8,000, right? So this means that even though the operating income is negative $18,000, if you're trying to boost the sales more, you're still able to cover the variable costs and fixed costs later on. You can't just exactly decide right now whether to drop it or not. It's not that definite. Okay, so if this fixed cost is not completely avoidable, for example, if all of them is unavoidable. You're just assigning these fixed costs to this department. You may decide to mix the products a little bit differently. For example, emphasize more on men's and women's, or try to make more marketing strategies on accessories department, because you still have a positive contribution margin, right? And the fixed costs, whether or not keeping or dropping the department, is always there. It's not avoidable. So this is a case that it is avoidable, so the total cost you're saving is 118000 But if the fixed cost is unavoidable, the cost you're saving is just $92,000 if you drop the department. So you still have $8,000 differences between the sales and cost saving. It's still a plus, the contribution margin. Okay, so you can't just directly make the decision of dropping it. It's not that certain because the fixed cost is avoidable, is unavoidable there.